Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jeremy Powers, and you're listening to the second episode of the GCN Cyclocross Podcast. Before we get into this week's episode, I gotta say thank you so much for all the love you showed. From the first episode, you guys gave us a ton of great feedback and sent a lot of messages. It meant a ton to me, and I read all of them, and I responded to just about all of them as well. If you're not involved yet, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and get involved with us. Hit us up on social media, at GCN Tweet on Twitter, and on Instagram at Global Cycling Network. Shoot us a line in the DMs. Let us know what you think. Today, we have a fantastic show for you all. Joining me on the episode is GCN's Marty McDonald. We're going to catch up on all the things that are going down in the United Kingdom and in the United States at the World Cup level, at the local level. We just jam. Then we catch up with my man Edwin Vrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Caitlin Keogh was having with Anna Kay for that third spot on the podium. Caitlin Keogh, very, very quick on the run. You could see that, and it was just going backwards and forwards between those two for that podium position. You can correct me if I'm wrong. The tougher the conditions, the more where that sort of running skill, those quick feet, it uh, seems to be those sections that, that are suiting her. Yeah, in the mud too, Marty. We got to talk about that for a second because pretty much across the globe right now, we are seeing a ton of precipitation. There's literally mud in every <laughs> single picture of cyclocross that I see on Instagram, no matter what country you're in. And it's pretty crazy to see all the precipitation and true cyclocross conditions coming out for the season. What's even more as impressive is when you'd say pre precipitation in live commentary. It's like when my daughter used to call it biscetti instead of spaghetti. I would never attempt that, especially live on TV. <laughs> I have to take my hat off to you for that one. I just stick with the rain. But how about Katarina Nash also keeping the overall lead? Do you know what? I've been commentating cyclocross a lot long time. For Katarina Nash, I've always been such a big fan. And, and just like my Danny McCaskill moment last week, I think, you know, Gig, you got to interview her recently as well. I think I'd probably have a proper fanboy moment as well if I, <laughs> if I, if I had that opportunity. Yeah. But she is such a superstar, isn't she? And again, as she said in her uh, interviews after she took that win, you know, doing it for, for those riders that are kind of around their 40s. And when you look at that World Cup podium of just over 21 years, big respect to her. I think, I think she's... I, I've always thought she's phenomenal. Yeah, man, she is. And uh, actually, that is the podcast that we have on today's episode, Marty. We're going to be catching up with Katarina and learning all about what she's been up to, what she's uh, a little bit of her history. We talk about all kinds of fun stuff. So definitely going to be a, a great chat for everyone to hear. What do we got coming up this weekend for live racing? So this weekend we are back. So we have the next round of the Etihad series, which is round four. That's uh, from Beringen. Gavara, the Super Prestige round three. We had such great great viewers on Super Prestige last week. I've got to say as well, out to the viewers, such great chat, the community that we're building and seeing how everyone's interacting with each other. Hats off to everyone that, that's tuning in. Yeah, it's been it's been fantastic to be able to have these races streaming for free on GCN Racing. So I look forward to when we get on the mic in person in a couple of weeks. Marty, thank you so much for your time today. Have a great week, pal. See you soon. Man, it is always so good to catch up with Marty. He's got so, so many things to talk about and think about it. He got to sit in the booth with Magnus Bagstead, the Perry roubaix winner, Tour de France stage winner, and talk cyclocross on the weekends on GCN Racing. I cannot think of something that is that cool. I'm going back to watch the races again on that side just to listen to Magnus Bagstead talk about cyclocross because I think it's pretty fun that he's now involved in commentating on the races. So shout out to Magnus Bagstead. Check those guys out this weekend coming up on the live racing. Next up is with the three-time world champ, almost as insane as talking to Magnus Bagstead, is jamming with Erwin Verveken about all the things that are going down in Belgian cyclocross. Erwin knows it all, you know? I mean, this week we talk about the racing contracts in Belgium. We're talking about all kinds of fun stuff. I'm gonna stop talking. Let's get into it. So Erwin, how is, what is going on this week in, uh, in Belgian cyclocross? We've got the Super Prestige and the DVV. The DVV trophy doesn't kick off until uh, the Koppenberg in uh, November, but this is the Super Prestige coming up. And the riders that are coming, the, one of the cool things about this series, I know a lot of the series, um, the riders have dedicated contracts to come to these races. So for the fans, that's amazing because they can count on these riders just about every single weekend being at these races on both the men's and the women's side, right? Yeah, so we have what we call a couple contract. So it's an overall contract for the whole series. Uh, both Super Prestige and DVV series have them uh, for men and women. And it means that uh, riders with such a contract can ride all races for a certain uh, fixed price. Uh, even if they would not perform well during the season, the, the, the price, uh, the amount stays the same. It's also for spectators and for organizers a certainty that uh, these riders are at the start. That's fantastic. You know, I would always, as I came over, get one contract to do a race or another contract, but a year-long thing, I can see why that would be so valuable to a promoter. Some of the racers that are on here that I see is Sana Kant, uh, Anna Marie Wurst, uh, Carmen Del Alvarado, uh, Elise Arzufi, Mod Captains, uh, and on the men's side, it's Tunerts, Lars Vanderhaar, Lauren Sweek, Michael Van Torenhout, and uh, Tom Pidcock. So there's definitely going to be some, some battles. Yeah, uh, most 
those are the, the, the good riders, uh, apart from uh, Walter and Mathieu, will be there. And we are uh, lucky because I'm, well, we organize uh, as, uh, as Colazzo, um, uh, the DVV series. Uh, we, we are lucky to start a bit later in the season and to have uh, Mathieu as a superstar doing uh, only our series as a, as a complete series this season. Uh, which is good. And so then I guess the next question is like, from the rider's point of view, right, they have these series that are going to be able to give them a start contract. So that's one way. But then they also, I was reading that the Super Prestige does a equal prize list overall for the women at the end, which I believe is, uh, is it is it 30,000 euros to win the Super Prestige overall? Yeah, that's, that's right. The UCI uh, made it mandatory that the top three in these rankings got the uh, same prize money for men and women. So prize money uh, per day is already the same for the past three seasons, if I'm correct. Um, and that means that in Category 1 races, like most of these races are um, uh, top men and women. So first position gets 5,000 euro. For the final ranking, it's 30,000 euro. And that's uh, the same in uh, in uh, DVV series. It's mandatory to make top three uh, equal prize money, but we already decided to to make the full top fifteen equal for men and women. That's that's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. Erwin, let me ask you one last question before I let you go. Just about the overall season. Now that the cyclocross season in Europe has started and it's absolutely going to go every single weekend. There's contracts, there's media, there's a lot of pressure to do well. How, when you were a rider, how did you deal and navigate with the like heavy Belgian cyclocross season? Is it like, what is, what is the thing that you can do or what is the thing that's going on in a rider's head? Cause you really are racing or you could race every single weekend. And it's, yeah, you have the series races starting up. They've already done a trip to the United States. It's it's a super heavy schedule, and I just would love for you to tell our listeners about kind of like mentally what that's like for you. You were three times world champion. You know, you had so many years of racing these series back to back to back. What is it that you do to like stay even keel like throughout the entire year and take it with patience, I would say? Well, I was probably a bit different than all the others. Um, I didn't mind so much uh, for the, the early season races. Uh, I took them as a, as a startup and uh, I actually never focused on being very good in, in October. Uh, I wanted to be good at, at the, yeah, the, in the Christmas period and in January when the, world, uh, the championships and national and uh, world championships are uh, coming up. Um, but most of the riders, uh, yeah, they, they try to be good in the beginning of the season. What I've learned is that, uh, yeah, uh, what we also see in recent years is that uh, uh, the, the salaries of the riders, so the, the, the amount they get in their yearly contract has been gone up uh, a lot. And, and I mean a lot uh, times four, times five in, in, in the past 10 years. So they benefit from uh, better contracts uh, and they don't have to ride these races anymore like we used to do. Uh, we used to ride a lot uh, Saturday, Sunday for start money because that was uh, the big part of our salary or of what we earned. Uh, and that has changed. So we see riders skipping certain races, uh, also going on a training camp, usually early December. So the season is, is, is more in two parts compared to what we did. Uh, the season is starting earlier, huh? so uh, with the World Cups in the States in September. Uh, but on the other hand, they, they have like a, a, sh a short break of a, a week or even two weeks last year, uh, early December. And yeah, um, I don't know if, if, if they deal with it very well, but I see every year riders uh, yeah, losing focus and, and losing uh, uh, freshness uh, towards the championships month. And I think that's still the, the most important uh, yeah, period of the season. Yeah. Yeah. I think just with the international calendar, right? Like the when, when you were at your peak and you're in your prime, you didn't have to travel. At, although you did come to the States a couple, quite a few I times, did, yeah. but, uh, yeah. but, but not at the World Cup level necessarily. There wasn't this like, and they weren't in September. So yeah, I guess the, you know, we can talk about this another time, but I, I would love to hear your thoughts maybe next time we catch up about, um, 
about how how American cyclocross or globalizing the sport is uh, is part of the plan and what your opinion is on that. But for this week, I'm going to clip it there. I'm going to let you go. I wanted to say thank you so much for uh, for checking in with us, and we'll catch up with you next week. Okay. Well, see you next week. Erwin's got that depth of knowledge that nobody can touch. He's been in all of it. He's still in all of it, and he just has such a great head on his shoulders as to be able to have him as a resource that we can talk to week in and week out about all the stuff that's going on over in Europe with cyclocross. So next up, we need no introduction. It is Katarina Nash. I've already told you about what we're talking about. I've already given you the insight. Just listen to the accolades at the beginning. They're going to blow your mind. Katarina is one of the most accomplished riders that I have the pleasure of knowing. She is a five-time Olympian, three times as a mountain biker, but before that, as a winter Olympian with cross-country skiing twice. So you also have quite a few other accolades. You've been on the podium of the World Cup Cyclocross a couple of times, uh, six to be exact, Vegas, Tabor, twice in Namur, uh, and as well as in Roubaix, um, two times at the Cyclocross World Championships podium in Sankt Wendel in 2011, and then in uh, Beals and Luxembourg recently. Um, you were multiple time <laughs> cyclocross national champion. The <clears throat> results don't actually go back far enough. The history books don't go back far enough to know exact <laughs> number of national championship titles no, that you have. I can figure it out. I should figure it out. Because actually, cyclocross is my youngest discipline. <laughs> I like that. I like that. All right. Well, we'll, we'll put that somewhere. <laughs> we'll find that out and put that on the, on the Twitter account. And you also have been on the podium of a, uh, a World Cup on the mountain bike as well. You've won. A World Cup mountain bike. Yes. Yeah. Which where was that? It was Monsanan. Wow, such yeah. a good, such a good course. Yeah, yeah. I if even if I haven't got that. a win, I like to win the classic ones. <laughs> so, so awesome. So yeah, so that's like not even really digging into all the mountain bike accolades. Um, it's pretty easy to say that you're a podium contender at literally any race that you roll into. Um, I don't think there's anyone that can argue with that. Well, I. No, I've done I've done really well, and I like the diversity. And for sure, like there's been time that I was you know consistently hitting summer World Cup podiums, and then switched over to cyclocross. And I I never really did full season in cross, so to speak, you know, because mountain biking's always been that's what I signed my contract for, that's what our team was focused on. But I don't know, there's something about cyclocross. It's just it's just like that everything else is kind of like, yeah, you're doing it because it's your job. But mm-hmm. cyclocross for me has just been a huge passion. And I just, even this year, you know, I didn't really know how much I'm, I was going to do because we're really shifted towards domestic mountain bike program with the Cliff Pro team. And I don't have any other teammates. So I was like, oh, well, hopefully there's a little bit of budget left for some cross racing. And uh, so, yeah, we figure it out. And I'm back here and just having really good time with it as yeah. always <laughs> yeah i mean i don't want to jump too far ahead but you just were on the podium at the last world cup so i think it's going it seems like it's going fine yeah i'm off to a good start <laughs> <laughs> for just being like i hope there's some money to get out there in a way i want to jump back but some people don't maybe know katarina nash so they might want to know where did katarina nash come from and i'm i'm curious because your upbringing is really interesting you started out as a you know, young woman in Czechoslovakia, um, and you now live in the United States. So I'd love to know a little bit about your parents, how you got into sport, and what it was like growing up in Czechoslovakia during that time. Yeah, so I was, I was born technically in Czechoslovakia pretty early. The two countries split up in two, and so uh, I am still competing for the Czech Republic and uh, grew up in a small town on the border with uh, Germany and Austria, and my parents were uh, pretty active. My dad was a soccer player, and my mom, uh, she's kind of like, she can do any sport. She can play music, she can do any sports, like she never really competed on any high level, but she can kind of do a whole bunch of things. And uh, so I get my start through just kind of family hikes and, you know, mm-hmm. camping and that kind of usual stuff. And the one thing that I joke about growing up in the communist country uh, that was that was really great was the fact that a lot of these parents, they, they didn't have their own company. You know, they just kind of had that job. They had to show up. And so there was a lot of free time. So everybody was involved with their kids. So mm-hmm. for me, I, I got involved with uh, gymnastics and then s- started to attend a ski club. 
And it was great because we had so many coaches. There was a closet full of skis. And if I wanted to do any kind of sport next week, I could do the same. Just join the club and there would be equipment and somebody take you out and introduces you to that. And so that that was really neat because we just, as kids, like had these endless opportunities to play. And I wasn't still not the kid who's going <laughs> to sit at the computer or read a book back then, obviously. And so outdoors... That was that was my thing, and that's what I've been, always been doing. And uh, to have that, uh, you know, that lifestyle kind of lead into my career, uh, it's been pretty awesome. So just quickly, uh, yeah, I went to like a ski academy for high school, and then led me to the national team, and I skied on the World Cup for a couple of years, and then decided to go to United States to the university, and I uh, I, I got here on a skiing scholarship. So that's kind of how I end up in the U.S. and. Uh, uh, halfway through the college, I ran out of my eligibility. I kind of made a return and ski at the Salt Lake Olympics, even though I was a full-time college student and skier. And then after that, I just, I just, you know, I was bike racing kind of for fun since high school, but never did it full-time. But I, I wanted to give it a try, and I felt like California might be a good place, and I looked for a team, and I just... Super, super lucky to uh, meet a bunch of guys at Cliff Bar and get on the team in 2002. And honestly, like I thought, well, two years in college, I'm just going to ride my bike while I'm, you know, finishing my degree. And somehow here we are 18 years later. <laughs> yeah. Having been to the Czech Republic actually was the home of my first world championships in Tabor, which was super cool for me. It was in 2001. And that experience of going there, it was totally surreal because I was my first time in Europe. But having been there multiple times for the World Cup and for the cyclocross culture that's there, they have their own, the, the I believe it's the Toy Toy Cup or mm -hmm. series. They have uh, quite a bit of racing. Every time that I've talked to you over the years, you always, when you're in Europe, it seems like you always go back and see family and friends when you're in town for the races. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's made like both my, you know, summer and winter racing so much more enjoyable because I don't have to sit in the hotel a week and maybe there's a little bit more logistics and a little extra travel, but it's great to just go back home and visit with family and friends. And I'm kind of thankful for a lot of the races in Europe, as tiring as it can be to fly from California. Yes. <laughs> Like yes. six times a year for both mountain biking and World Cups. It, uh, yeah, it just just helped me to get back home and stay connected to my family and super thankful for that. But I want to jump back to the um, cyclocross um, kind of scene. And I grew up watching cyclocross on TV, mm -hmm. you know, and it was like... There's no women's racing, you know, and I always thought it was the coolest thing ever. But it wasn't until I got on Luna that Allison Dunlop was heading to cross races. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? what? That sounds rad. Like, this is cool. And then it took me another few years until Georgia, uh, Georgia Gold, uh, joined the team, and she was heading to cyclocross. So really, thanks to Georgia, I got into it because she was going. So I was like, I'll come with you and we'll just mm -hmm. uh, try. And uh and Gloucester was actually my very first uh, USGP. Gosh, that would and, have been a great first race. <laughs> and I was hooked, you know, yeah. ever since I was hooked and ever since I figured out a way to kind of do my summer drop on the mountain bike, but play, you, play in the cross. <laughs> you have a dedicated crew that come out. They're <laughs> yeah. pumped that you're there. It's not like, this isn't like, oh, like, hey, come on. No, they have like chants and songs and like bongos and they're like so ecstatic that you are <laughs> from Czech Republic and that you're representing their country at this level. I mean, you have a crew. Well, the funny thing <laughs> about this crew is that <laughs> people always say that, oh my God, you have this fan club over there. I'm like, actually, it's pretty much whole family. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool though. That's great. It's uh, my mom comes from a big family, three sisters, a lot of cousins. And, um, you know, we all kind of live close to Tabor, you know, so that makes it quite perfect. <laughs> and so sweet, a few though. years ago at the last World Championship at Tabor, um, I mean, both of them, um, I even had my grandmother out there, you know, and oh, it was amazing. spectacular because you know how cold and miserable it gets yeah. in Czech Republic during that time of year. And she was a trooper. She just stayed out there the whole day and yeah. it was awesome. How old is your grandmother? I, well, I, I don't want to ask. <laughs> I have two. I have both grandmothers, actually. But this particular grandma, that she turned 90 this uh, July, 
and I was able to go back home earlier summer for a surprise party. So it was pretty uh-huh. rad. I'm just thinking out loud. So you're one of the most competitive older riders in the group right now, but your grandmother's still like ripping it up at 90 plus. <laughs> so we might not even be halfway through. When you think about that, that's right. got to be something. It's like, you're like, man, I'm not even halfway through. Like there's a lot to do. You have a lot of time here. Well, We're just talking about longevity. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot to do and I should probably do some other things in life. Let's put it that way. No, please as, don't. Please as don't. you know, it's, uh, man, like the recovery just, it just slows down it drastically. Does. And it's uh, like at times it's like awesome because you're like, well, I can't train that many hours anymore. But then you also like get to that point, you kind of frustrated <laughs> because you can. So it's a fine balance. So one thing that you talked about that I think would be cool to, to, to speak on is the Cliff Bar relationship because you said you've ridden for them since 2002. That is pretty incredible. I rode for Jelly Belly for 10 years and I didn't change teams and people always thought that that was pretty unique. But 2002 to now is a uh, that that like pretty much doubles that time. <laughs> yeah. I, I would love for you to just talk about them as a company. You guys have done so many cool things together over the years. Initiatives. Um, you've been part of a lot of the the things that Cliff Bar stands for. I think that you are you're you're as Cliff Bar as it gets. <laughs> I want to know what it's like working for them and how and everything that's gone into that. And I probably want to know what your favorite Cliff Bar is too. I mean that would seem, <laughs> that only seems right. Yeah, I mean, we could we could definitely talk about Cliff Bar probably all day and yeah. what what the what the team has accomplished over the years and uh, kind of leading the charge on the supporting female athletes and having a um, having a you know big team and great teammates and we weren't really just just involved in the racing even though that was the most like famous and most out there program but we also started the ambassador team which uh, it was just essentially to encourage women to exercise and sort of develop these little clubs whether it's biking or triathlon or running in the major cities where the entry into exercise or let's say mountain biking you live in the you know you move to a big city and you have no idea where to go mountain biking and it was really really fun to have probably close to 300 members around the country. So there's been so many things that the team was involved with, you know, away from the racing. And obviously Cliff Bar, one of the leaders in sustainability and, Big time. you know, like they're not doing one thing during the strike yesterday. They're just kind of like, we've been doing it for 30 years. Yes. Like we got to do it every single day and Big they're time. doing it. And so it's, it's great to be working with a company that cares on so many different levels. It's their community, their environment, their product, everything, you know, their employees, their their athletes. And it, it shows. And uh, yeah, I feel beyond fortunate to be on their team for this long. Yeah. And uh, I think um, they're offering me another contract. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprised. Uh, <laughs> Not surprised. I think, unfortunately... The, they can't, they can't the get rid of me. <laughs> yeah, no, you're there for the, I think you're there until it clears out. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's jump into women's racing because you were talking about that. You have done a lot of initiatives, I would say. You've done a lot with women's racing. You also part of the UCI commission. You're pretty involved. You've also sort of been there when it's been, um, I wouldn't, I don't, I, I'm just going to say when it's been crappy, <laughs> Yeah. right? And, and you persevered. And I like to think that it's in a, better, much better place now. Viewership has continued to increase mm. with the ability to broadcast these races and the desire to do it. Sure. Companies like where we are now here at Trek headquarters, they put a lot into making sure that the women's prize lists are equaled. Um, there has been quite a bit of pushing this this boulder, we'll call it up a mm. hill and making it go forward. So love to talk about when it was bad and the <laughs> opportunities that you were able to carve yeah. out for yourself. Uh, I, I even saw that you were like doing, you've been doing stuff with Little Bellas. I know you do stuff in, I think it's Trucky where you are from. You're doing like community programs there because um, I see this all on your social media. <laughs> Maybe at the second part of that question could be about the UCI. Well, I, I would say it's definitely like the best time to be a female athlete, I think, yeah, right now. I do and, too. And, but the work is never done. It's never done no. for racing in general. You know, we got to keep... Keep making it uh, better and looking after everybody, whether it's the the race promoters, the racers, the sponsors, the media. Like take care of everybody, you know, because we we all kind of 
creating this content essentially right. you know it's uh, we're just kind of performers mm-hmm. and if we do good job then we all can just you know have these jobs where we ride our bikes and that's right <laughs> don't have to sit in the <laughs> office you know so it's it, it is a uh, it's interesting because um, like you said I I do um, I sit on three different commissions at the UCI now so I've, I'm getting like the the inside look of like what does it take to organize a race you know I think most of us, we just like show up at the event. Everything's looking pretty much perfect. You know, there might be a sketchy corner. We tell somebody and they change it and it's by the race time, it's perfect. And, you know, and so you don't understand the process that goes into the event. And I think that's been really powerful for me to see. I always knew, but just kind of being part of that whole process, it's it's been really good. And I have a uh, huge appreciation for all the work that people do so we can line up at the start line and have a good conditions and safe course and prize money and all mm-hmm, of that, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, so it's pretty rad. And to put it in perspective, cyclocross prize money on the World Cup level is very good. Mm-hmm. Cyclocross is doing really, really well. Also, also with the C1 uh payout you know yeah having said that yes we gotta keep pushing for you know for equality for for everything and uh with the uci having kind of outlined the payout schedule over next two season i think that that gives the race promoters a chance to sort of catch up with that expense because it is jumping (laughs) drastically i don't know it's it's exciting times i wish i was 20 that's all i got to say (laughs) yeah it would be great wouldn't it so like yeah for all the riders that are coming up i mean it truly is because you guys you guys laid a lot of pavement you know what i mean you guys put a lot of a lot of work into making that road for them to be able to have a successful career i mean i feel the same way in some ways for my own you know for sure yeah and i think but that's the beauty like i picked up the ball and ran with it and now it will be uh ev uh uh, Richards and Ellen Nobles and Aunt Marie Worst that will now pick up the ball and they'll run with it they more. They will have to uh, do the following yeah. work. But yeah, I think it's like it's like anything, you know, you just gotta uh, we fight on the course, but we also have to make sure that uh, everything kind of falls in place and that our work is meaningful and yeah. and yeah, like we didn't pick a sport where we all gonna be super rich but you do want to have that opportunity to travel the world and you know if you did well here the world cups in in the united states you should you should be able to kind of figure out a way to go and do a few more in yeah. europe you know and not not be like you know maxing out your credit cards That's and right. stuff like yeah, that you know and honestly like i think cycling and some people may forget that like we're so fortunate because it's not you know, like you you know, it is your job for some of us, but it really is not our job. Mm-hmm. Like these teams are also help us to kind of reach these personal goals and mm-hmm. do this wonderful kind of live this wonderful lifestyle in a way, you know. So uh, I, you know, like I, I definitely encourage some riders to be like, you know what, like, okay, the team didn't make it happen. Like you make it happen. Mm-hmm. Like if you want to do it, just go make it happen, you know, like, um I, I made it happen with cyclocross. I just I just wanted to be out there, and yeah. I knew I wasn't gonna make any prize money, you know. But I still went out there and did it, and it's it's great. It's great to be in it now and be like, oh, if I have a good weekend, I can make some money, and it's great. And yep. that's why I think, honestly, like not just the prize money, but where the sport has developed to. Like, that's why you see people like me and Katie, because we lived through a different era. And now it's just like, we don't want to leave. It's so cool. <laughs> I know. I mean, I even felt the same way as you spend a lot of time developing your your brand. I hate mm-hmm. to say that, but it really is. You, Katerina Nash or Katie Compton or whoever, you guys, you, you develop an, a, a personality in a way. And I think that people finally are able to be exposed to it. And then they want to be a part of what you're doing. Uh, do you feel now at this time in the sport that there is like adoration and that people have a much better understanding of like you're you're like I said in my intro you're one of the most accomplished riders that I know personally you know what I mean I think that that's uh without question I mean you've been to the Olympics five times I don't want to keep this going but like (laughs) you always felt like you were an athlete but do you feel like the respect now is being reciprocated and at least that story is told and people they, they, they say yeah. hi to you because they want to (laughs) maybe in a different way than they did when it was like oh the women's race is a sideshow yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think um, as the teams, as UCI, as the race promoter, everybody just kind of started to 
introduce the women's field. You know, you need you need to get the story. Like you created stories, and everybody knows you. You've done a really good job. Mm. You, the cyclocross of the United States. Mm. You know, whether it's here or Europe or in Australia, if if somebody asks, name one U.S. cross racer, it would be you. Mm. You know, you put your story out there, and you created this amazing content that people wanted to watch and they wanted to learn about you and you know and that's kind of what has happened with social media people people have a platform to tell their story and um there's always somebody who will you know just connect on that you know whatever that (laughs) story might be you know there might be connection and i think the fans they're they're thankful for that because before it was just like had to wait for the magazine article and it was very Mm -hmm. you know I don't want to say censorship, but it was, you know, it, you, you kind of told your story, but the questions were prepared and, you know, you weren't really telling your complete story. So nowadays you can, and, and that's how, why the fans are so much uh, more involved. They know a lot more about you. Um, I definitely feel like, yeah, people know me and uh, they respect what I've accomplished, but uh, I like. I kind of like to kind of fly under the radar a little bit, you know, sure. like it's, it's hilarious. We're not going to let that happen. Uh, <laughs> because people like don't recognize me at the airport ever. And it's the funniest thing. I kind of enjoy it. So, uh, yeah, I like, I like the both worlds. Like I'm not like, you know, I won't, I won't go into Take much. it or leave it. Take it or leave it. You know, I, I, I definitely like to talk about, uh, just kind of the lifestyle, uh, but uh, there's a lot of sad moments in my life, and I'm not gonna drag it through right. social media. <laughs> I totally get that. Yeah, I mean, and that's and that's right. That's the same for everyone, right? I have bad days. I don't put that on social media, and mm-hmm. you don't either. Like, yeah, not every day is perfect. That's yeah. just how life yeah. is. It's for a, sure. It's a highlight reel, but it's good because. I wouldn't want to read about someone's like all their negative stuff. I just want to be like, I want to, if I want to go on there, I want to be pumped up. Yeah. Yeah. We have enough negativity <laughs> yeah, in the right. world. You just read so the news if you need that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I, um, I do think that it's really cool that someone, I think at this point, way more so because of the connectivity of social media and because of the way that we're able to showcase our events and our talent, like the ability for a young girl, maybe here in Wisconsin, uh, a young woman would be able to see Katarina Nash as a successful 42-year-old, 41-year-old athlete. <laughs> I'm so sorry. 41-year-old athlete that has had so much success that has made a living from riding their bike. I think that that's, that's really, yeah, that's yeah. probably like, you know, across the board. I mean, that's beautiful. You don't have to answer it. That's not yeah. really a question. It's just like, I do think <laughs> no, that we're living in a I, nice time. You know, I definitely, I appreciate when people come up and uh, they just, you know, they, they kind of know your story and they want to just say thank you for being here and for, you know, like uh, fighting in every race and making it exciting. And, <laughs> and I, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I enjoy. Speaking of uh, Instagram and social media, what about your dogs? I wanted to talk about them because it's, <laughs> is it Lola and Ruby? Yes. <laughs> They've had some pretty famous visitors, or maybe maybe there's been some requests to meet Lola and Ruby because uh, I've seen uh, world champion Kate Courtney, I've seen Peter Sagan, all wanting like portraits with your. Is it their uh, visas, right? I don't think they want it. It's just more <laughs> me driven. I'm like, like oh I, my dog, really. On. I like that story better though that they needed this. This, so they yeah, like wanted yeah. to come to you. Yeah, I mean, like you the know, fame, the fame pretty, monster of the dogs is pretty, pretty big. Cool dogs, and I, <laughs> you know, I drag them everywhere. They're kind of, um, they're a big part of my life, and uh, yeah, they're your partners. Like I can uh, see it. I can see like <laughs> I obviously love my dog so much, and and he's definitely like. He's my he's my guy. Like yeah, not, nothing yeah. <laughs> like yeah. yeah. You have kids though. Yeah, so I do have one kid. Too. <laughs> it does, but the dog is still on that same level at the moment. My wife would definitely she would agree that that the dog is a is equally as big a part. And I make it that way because because we've had our dog for nine years now, and it's important that he still has that same level yeah. of like love. Mm-hmm. I don't want him to feel he exactly. already is jealous. Right, <laughs> like, right. We already have this fight, but. <laughs> Yeah, just like they seem like they're your partners. Like you take them ex- exercising with you. You're skiing. They're running yeah, with you. You're yeah. riding. They're out there with you. Yeah, Pictures. they don't ride much anymore. They're nine and ten, yeah. so they don't love the bike anymore. Yeah. So I respect that. So it's yeah. it's funny because I just, I mean, for cyclists, I do so much walking. It's ridiculous. You know, I probably sometimes walk as much as I ride <laughs> on any given day. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah, it's because <laughs> of them. But I don't know. We've had so much fun. And I know. Yeah, I you've lived you've lived a part of your life with them. And. Um, they, I, you know, I, I joke that, that, like, I mean, they, 
they've been to so many places that like in like maybe a month or two months, you know, it is like they go, they live in Tahoe and sometimes you go to Bay Area and we've gone to BC and you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, most people would just love to, like, they would love to go on vacation to one of these places a year, you know? <laughs> and, like, right. my dogs don't even know how lucky they are. But uh, I don't know. They deserve it. They're awesome. They, they're they my everything. So I, I want to read something that um, another writer that we had on the show, Magalie Rochette, had said about you recently in, a, in, a, in an Instagram post. And I think this is, I have to say, there's a lot of stuff that comes out on Instagram that I that I read that, that doesn't stick with me. But this one, this one's stuck with me. So I'm going to read she's it. A, for she's everyone. a good writer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's a little long, so just bear with me. But so she said, winning a World Cup has always been my my goal, but sharing a World Cup podium with my friend was a wild dream. You work hard and long to gain all that knowledge and experience in cycling, and it would be totally respectable to keep it to yourself. But Katerina Nash is different. Ever since I met her, she has always shared tips, advice, and opinions with me. She has yelled tactics during races. We had battles in the past, and she told me how and why she was able to beat me and how I could have beaten her. So I could learn. She said she would never give me a win, but that I'd have to earn it. But she said that she believed I could win and that I had to truly believe it too. We've shared great moments, many hotel rooms together, but sharing my first World Cup podium with Katarina will always be one of the most special moments for me. And she thanked you um, as just being an amazing and an incredible person. I think that that's really special. And I and I just wanted to, I mean, I want to focus on uh, that you yelled at her during races, um, <laughs> during battles, and then afterwards would tell her how and why and all of that. Well, like, it takes a special person to also listen, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we're talking a good age gap between me and Magali, and she came on the team, and I don't think she was even 20, you know? But some young riders, they're kind of like... I don't say intimidated, but they just kind of go about learning different way. But for her, from day one, she was never shy to ask. And it's our obligation to share what we know. You know, like you probably made so many mistakes in your career and you see your friend kind of heading that way. Wouldn't you stop that friend and be like, actually, take that Take a left mm-hmm. <laughs> here, Definitely. and uh, I don't know. I really enjoyed it. I I, I love being Magalie's teammate, and uh, you know it's so fun to watch where she's going with Cross, and obviously that first World Cup win, it was coming. <laughs> yeah, we all knew it, but until it happens, you know, you just kind of like you don't know is it gonna happen. So it's it's been really fun to watch her, and uh, I yeah, I'm excited. Like I. In a way, like, uh, you know, I have this extra interest in cyclocross when I'm maybe not out there because I know she's going to be around for a long time and do great, great things. And, yeah, no, I mean, I'm always open. Like, people ask me about coaching and stuff, and I'm like, no, no, that's too much work. But just come talk to me anytime. I'm always available. Like, I will answer emails. I'm just not – I'm not in the place that I want to, like – coach anybody and be in charge like you know of their training and stuff because really like big part of my day is dedicated to cycling and when I come home I just want to hang out with my dogs or drink wine or you know do whatever but uh, I just kind of forget the cycling part yeah I'm always happy to talk to anybody so all the young girls out there or guys really (laughs) if you have any questions don't be shy stop by the cliff bar tent at any of these races or reach out Um, I also sit at the UCI Cyclocross Commission representing cyclocross racers. And so any kind of feedback is valuable. You know, I encourage people and I'll probably put it on the Twitter because we're going to go into our next meeting. And so, yeah, that that do. Don't, don't be shy. Come talk to me. <laughs> You're extremely humble. I, I think that reading that just kind of sets the tone for where we're at. I, uh, I think it's really special. I think yeah, it's cool. That was a great it's... post. It, it definitely, like I said, Lot read a lot of things that one left yeah, like a yeah. yeah a little spot. And <laughs> you know, we all know Magalie and we know that comes from her heart, you yes, know, which course. is really that's that's really so meaningful cool. and really cool. And we were finally able to like sit down, have dinner last weekend and that was so fun because it felt like good old days just hanging out with her. I just I just miss hanging out with her so yeah. much and we took different directions. She's more cross and different team now and I'm, you know, still on the mountain bike yeah. and so um 
I just mainly miss her, you know. <laughs> I just wish I, I could. I do, I do. Could get you it. tell in the race? I was like, wait, I yeah, miss you. Why I, don't you that slow wasn't down? The exact conversation I think you guys were having. I saw a bit of drool coming off you, and I saw her with her mouth wide open going as hard, but like your great friend that you helped bring up uh, went on to win a World Cup, and you were the person well, that I was can, chasing I can take all the credit for her, for her work. That's because right. then you like, yeah. I did that. Yeah, See put that it girl forward. Here. That's right. I helped. You had you had a small part in that, and that's that's it. It takes a village always. Yeah. At this point, there's so many things we could talk about, but I, I just want to know if there's something that is in your mind as something that you really want to accomplish before. I mean, I know you're going to start another contract with Clipper. I have no 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 question that you'll race for quite a few more years, and I and I and I personally would love to see you continue on. Is there anything else in your mind that you feel like you need to accomplish within the sport? You're doing a lot. You're doing all of this stuff with women cycling. You're at the commission level. You're doing great things representing us, which I think is so cool that your peers elected you. I want people <laughs> to understand that the UCI, you don't just get like selected by the board. No, like your peers, we all voted at, I think in Luxembourg at the World Championships. Yeah. Yeah. All the riders, we voted to have someone elected, another rider to represent yeah. us at the UCI level. And then actually from that, so there's an athletes commission. So you guys voted me into the athletes commission. But yes. then that Athletes on the commission elected me to be the president of the athletes commission, which right. sends me to the management committee. So that's so that's kind that, of a big deal. It's a really big deal, <laughs> and and I can't think of a better person to do it. Being totally straight, like there is nobody in cyclocross, in my opinion, that has the depth. And yeah, you just yeah. have so much depth. Well, I'm, I'm mainly. I'm there to fight for the off-road disciplines. You know, I love that. We have, and that's we have plenty of road person. racing at the UCI, and it's, uh, you know, I have credibility in two different uh, off-road disciplines, and it's it's good to stand up and fight, fight for it. <laughs> I'm happy that you are there. You see it all, and you're there, you know, you see everything. So just that's to say that you've already accomplished so much, and is there one thing that you, like, go to bed at and I think, like, oh, I'd really like that. I mean, you've had a very fulfilling career. Mm. Well, for years, it was definitely the rainbow jersey. You know, yeah. I tried to, tried really, really hard, and I, I didn't do it in either one of those disciplines that I focus on. I was never really that close in mountain biking. I mean, I've, I was on the World Cup podium uh, a bunch, but I always fell apart for worlds for some reason. And uh, cyclocross, I was a little bit closer, but uh, couldn't really get there. And, uh, yeah, I don't I don't even know if I do worlds this year, to be honest. So it's, I, I, I probably would say that that's something that I just, you know, I'm, I'm okay with not having. It's not, it's just not going to change my career in any way at this point, you know. Probably don't get better contract or worse contract. <laughs> I don't think so. So it's, uh, I don't know, That that's the pinnacle of... Uh, of our sport, and I I didn't do it, but um, I gave it a honest effort for many many years, and that's that's all that matters, I guess. So yeah. yeah. Well, that was what I have. I think it was really awesome conversation. I'm I'm grateful that you came out with us and, and spent some time. Thank and you. I want to thank you for being on the podcast, and we'll see you out there. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for putting cyclocross on TV. This is the best. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thanks. That interview with Katarina blows my mind. That fact that she's, just think about that with Magalie Rochette. She literally told someone how to beat her. I think that alone needs nothing else to be said. That shows her maturity, her depth as a writer, her amazing personality, and just who she is as a person. It's fantastic to see that type of camaraderie. And I uh, give her a lot of credit for all that she's accomplished in her career. That is today's episode. I hope you guys liked it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please share it if you did. Please send it around. Shoot us a line on social, like I said before. Subscribe if you haven't yet. Leave us a review. Thank you guys so much for checking in this week, and I'll talk to you soon.